Martin stood up from his couch and set down his half-finished newspaper crossword puzzle. It was three in the afternoon, which meant he had little time left to get around for work. He walked with a slight limp over to his bedroom, where he replaced the button-up T-shirt he had on with a fine suit, one of four in his limited closet. Then he switched into dress pants and walked to the bathroom. His reflection in the mirror didn't feel like him. Every time he looked over the last week, it was as if he was staring at someone new, someone put together. He adjusted his bow tie and fumbled with his razor, holding it with both hands to make sure he didn't cut his face with the blade. Then, when he was satisfied with the cut, he wandered back to the bedroom, and from the front pocket of his button-up T-shirt, he pulled a coin, which he promptly put in the suit jacket. After running through a list of items written on a sticky note, which had been placed on the fridge, he confirmed he was ready to go and stepped out the front door of his apartment. Once he'd managed to lock the door with his shaky hands, he carefully hobbled down the stairs to the ground floor and started the walk to the bus stop. It would arrive in 20 minutes and he'd be at the Stone Diner in 40. Day seven of the first job he'd had in decades. The novelty hadn't worn off yet, and he hoped it never did. Not that he was doing it for himself. It was all for a woman with too big of a heart. I'm glad we could all come together one last time before college starts, Mailer said, reclining in her spot in the restaurant booth. Her friends sat with her, focused either on her words or their phones. Yeah, me too, one friend Candy said. Everything is going to be so different. I know. I don't know how the three of you are going to survive without having regular access to me. You might actually have to get jobs. Sure, but what are you going to do? I'll find other girls who want to fawn over me. It won't be hard. Speaking of hard, her friend Tammy said, I'm seriously not sure what to do about the Danny situation. Mailer had deemed Tammy the least important in her friend group, and she was regularly skipping their meetups to go out with Danny, her boyfriend of two years. It was beginning to cause serious damage to her status in the group. Any more interruptions like that, and she could face some serious consequences. Mailer turned to confront her least favourite friend of the group. I think it's about time I said this, Tammy. You need to stop seeing Danny. He's a bad influence on you. Honestly, for a year there, you weren't even sure he loved you. That's not true, she countered. One of her other friends, Emma, shook her head. It kind of is true. You didn't know what to do with yourself when he went away for a week. Remember the breakdown party? How could we forget the breakdown party, Mela said. The worst birthday party of my life. 18 was supposed to be the year, Tammy. I still think 18 is your year, Mailer, Candy said, arching one hand over her shoulder. Candy was Mailer's long-standing favourite, if only because she was the biggest suck-up. She'd survived every rotation of friends and had gotten her fair share of favours because of it. I guess we'll see. It really feels like a turning point. There weren't many people like Mailer Stone in the small town she lived in. She knew this too. The teenager was conventionally attractive, with medium-length brown hair and equal eyes. She dressed to impress, largely thanks to her mother's successes with her businesses, choosing a purple dress and high heels. And, most importantly, she fought to stay the centre of attention no matter where she went. The restaurant, Stone Diner, was her mother's biggest venture. The place had almost become a second home to her. Every floor plan, every person on shift, and every food item was locked into her brain, and so she knew that at this specific hour of this specific day, she could ignore the person at the front desk and lead her three friends to a booth in the private areas in the back where they had immediately reclined their feet on the cushions. So, who's paying tonight? Candy asked, looking around at the three others. 
Her eyes lingered on Myla for much longer. You say that as if it's ever anybody else, she replied, revealing her debit card. Tonight is a celebration after all. An older gentleman wearing the required service suit approached their booth and smiled at the four of them. My apologies, ladies. I didn't see the four of you come in on our system. Did you check in with the people up front? Mela was taken aback. The man standing in front of her was brand new, and in her mind, way too old to be doing the job. She thought her mum had finally agreed to only hire the hot guys in their twenties, not this. Actually, we don't need to check in or get reservations. My mum owns the place. I'm Mela Stone. But since you're here, I'll gladly get my drink order. He seemed surprised for a moment. Understood, Miss Stone. My name is Martin, and I will be your waiter for the day. What can I get you to drink? A tea is fine. Two lemon slices, and they'll all have waters. Martin looked at the rest of them to confirm, something he found quite odd, but they either stared at him or nodded. I will get that to you right away. As he walked away, Mela rolled her eyes. I'm going to have to have another talk with Mom at some point. Did she seriously just hire some geriatric old man to the restaurant? He looks like she picked him off the street and put him in a suit. He looks like the men I get in my Instagram notifications, Tammy said. No, I think he looks more like the men in mine. All the men in yours are desperate. Mine, no beauty. Have you decided what you're going to college for yet? Emma asked, not even looking up from her phone. If you'd been paying attention last week, Emma, you'd know that I was going for a business degree so that I could take over Mum's role as the owner of this place. Martin returned to the booth with their drinks, the three waters and tea. He began to dish them out, but Mela put her hand up. No need to bother. I'll take care of this. There's an order we have to go in. He nodded and set the drinks on the table, plate included. What can I get you for to eat then? Candy will have a sirloin and a salad, medium well. Tammy is going to have the same, but medium. Emma is vegan, so she gets two salad orders. And I will have the cream of broccoli soup, a medium rare sirloin and a salad. Once again, he made eye contact with the other three to confirm her words and bowed. I'll get these out for you as soon as I can. You, is he limping? Candy asked as he walked away. Your mom sure knows how to pick the winners, Mailer. Please, I don't want to think about him anymore. Here, Candy, then Emma, then Tammy, and mine last, of course. I'm a humble queen. She took a drink of hers, and the rest followed. Emma went immediately back to her phone. Is there something more important you're tending to right now, Emma? Sorry, my dad just got admitted to the hospital while we were walking. Sounds like his heart is having troubles again. Would you rather be there? She looked at Myla, doing her best to not crack. Well, I... It's all right. My mom and brother are with him. It can wait. Good. Now, anyway, college. My mum is naturally paying for my tuition, meaning when I head out in two weeks, all I'll have to worry about is finding the right sorority. Oh, and the classes, I guess. Cool, Candy responded simply. They sat quietly for 15 minutes as Mailer grew more impatient. This new waiter should have been told that she took priority over the rest of the customers, and that she was suffering from an outrageous wait time. When he finally came into view, after 20 minutes, her foot was tapping on the floor. 20 minutes to wait is unacceptable. I'm terribly sorry, Miss Stone. Please allow me to dish this out for you. No, thank you. You've done enough damage. I will... As she grabbed the serving plate to wrestle control of the food away from Martin, it all came crashing down. Five salads three sirloins, and a cream of broccoli soup toppled onto her, 
coating her dress and hair in hot soup, ranch, fries, steak, and an assortment of vegetables. The room was completely still for a brief moment, and then her friends started laughing. I'm so sorry, Miss Stone, Martin said, quickly grabbing the towel from his sleeve to help with the mess. You're like the floor of a buffet, Emma said, holding her phone up to take a picture. God, you look so stupid right now. Completely soaked, Tammy added, pointing at her chest. Looks like you chose soup and salad. Candy said nothing, but couldn't hold back the small giggle that was bursting through the hand over her mouth. Mela stood up, and most of the mess rolled off onto the floor. Shut up, all three of you. This is pathetic. This old loser pours food over me and you lose your mind. She turned to face him. I've never seen someone behave so completely ignorantly in the three years we've owned this place. Nobody has the audacity to do something this, this stupid, you clumsy idiot. I'm terribly sorry, Miss Stone. I understand your... I don't think you do understand. Does he look like he understands? There was something wild in her eyes as she looked at her friends and pointed at Martin. Every bit of joy was sucked out of their faces. They looked at her, then back at the older man who was trying to wipe the booth. I'm surprised you even had the brain capacity to get the job, Candy said, first to switch immediately back to Mailer's side. Yeah, um... I think you're too old to even be out of the nursing home, Emma said. Tammy fidgeted with her hands. I mean, it was an accident. It could have happened to anyone. Did it happen to anyone, Tammy? Or did it happen to me? Daughter of Angela Stone? Owner of the restaurant? When Tammy didn't have an answer, she stepped out of the booth. Tom! Oh, Tom! Within the minute... The manager on shift that night, Tom, rounded the corner, then slowed to see the mess that was all over her and the booth. What a pned here. Perhaps you should ask the one who's too old to be working a job like this. Maybe he could tell you how the entire table's order ended up on my dress. Tom, I demand you fire him. He scratched the back of his head. I mean... I'm not really sure I have the jurisdiction to... Who does then, Tom? Do you want me to get my mother involved in this? Fire Mark, or whatever his name is, or I'll call her and have you fired too. Is that what you want? Tom debated the options in his head. He knew Angela, and he wasn't sure she would actually go through with firing him just because he didn't listen to Mailer. But the last thing he needed was her daughter making his life a personal hell. Martin, I'll have someone else clean up the mess. Could you... Could you come with me for the moment? Right, of course, sir. He turned to face the group of teenagers one last time. What's wrong, old man? These are the consequences of your actions. I'm sure if your wife is still alive, she'll tell you the same thing. It looked like he was crying and only for a split second did she worry she went too far. Her hostile words stirred in his heart, but not because they hurt him. They reminded him of her, and he could never think of her without the weight of what happened. I'm terribly sorry, Mela, he said. As the two left, all attention was back on Mela. Hate to say it, but I think we should call this off. I can't be seen like this, and I'm too worked up to eat. Do you want to plan something for another day? Candy asked, getting up from her seat. We'll see. Go see your dad or whatever, Emma. The other three left the booth, leaving Mela standing alone in the private area, still covered in dinner. One week later, Angela Stone was walking the same sidewalk to Stone Diner. She was dressed for business and certainly wasn't looking for attention. For the last time, Dalton, I won't be accepting higher than 50000 for the offer, she said into her phone. If he wants to sell the chain, he needs to realise its actual worth.
not how much he wants it to be. I understand that, Miss Stone, but you need to understand the proposition. Even for 75, you'll be making your money back in two years, tops. Those two locations have more potential than half of the competition in the county. 50. Take it or leave it. She ended the call as soon as she entered the doorway of Stone Diner, giving a polite smile to those waiting to be seated and stealing a quick look at the system monitor to see how busy it was for the day. Any chance of filling in the back? She asked the lady at the system. Two reservations tonight. But otherwise, we might fit another family or two. Get that old couple in one. Make sure drinks are offered. Angela hurried through to scope out how the floor was doing. Almost every seat was full, with the exception of two tables getting wiped. She approached one of them and placed a hand on the cleaner's shoulder. How is the retention tonight? He glanced up from the mess he was cleaning. Not too bad. We're looking at pretty quick rotations tonight. Great. Has my daughter been in yet? No. Think she was last week. There was a pretty big scene about it. You'll have to ask Tom. Don't worry, I will. There was one specific person she was looking for, aside from Tom. But as she completed her loop around the restaurant, something wasn't quite adding up. There was a part of her that became incredibly worried, but she kept it hidden until she reached the back office. Tom, she said, practically throwing the door open. Good to see you, Angela. We've been having a pretty good night, all things. Where is he, Tom? When was the last time he came in? Who? Martin, the older gentleman. When was the last time he came in for his shift? Oh, um, I had to let Martin go. What? She took a seat directly across from him. Why? What happened? Did he stop showing up? Was he drunk? He promised he was sober. No, it wasn't any of that. It was your daughter. He spilled an entire tray of food onto her, and she demanded I fire him. Her hand gripped the arm of the chair intently. You let him go, because my daughter told you to. She threatened to have me fired too, Angela. I didn't figure you would do something like that, but... I can't believe the audacity you have, Tom. My daughter does not run this business. I do. If she has a business concern, she should bring it up with me. And so should you. Is that clear? Respectfully, Angela. He wasn't a great worker, and we wouldn't keep anyone else after dumping food all over a customer. I don't understand why you're so upset about this. This is strike two, Tom. I will deal with my daughter and Martin. Get him back on the schedule immediately, starting tomorrow. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go deal with the consequences of your actions. As she got up to leave, he asked, What about the quarterly reviews? We still have all of those scheduled for tonight. Well, you should have thought of that before you fired my biggest asset, Tom. She arrived at the front doorstep of his apartment complex half an hour later. The sidewalk to the front steps was cracked and uneven, and the grass around the edges had died. Bottles of beer lined the mulch near the bay windows of the first floor apartments, and she cursed under her breath. That had better not be him. Each step in her raised heels echoed against the concrete steps to the second floor, where she found the door to apartment 265. She knocked on it twice, waited a few moments and knocked again. After getting no response, she opted to try the door handle, which was unlocked. Martin, she called, peeking her head in through the door. She wasn't immediately hit with the smell of room temperature beer, which was at least partially good news. As she stepped inside, her eyes drifted to the pile of newspapers and mail on his tiny kitchen table. The top item, already open, read in large, bold letters, Overdue. She picked it up briefly, 
saw it was about his rent, and sighed. Martin! She entered the living room, where he sat on an old couch, staring down at a crossword puzzle. He was wearing a thrifted button-up t-shirt and jeans, and had his veteran hat on. His glasses rested at the bridge of his wrinkled nose, and a single lamp illuminated the room. Martin, what are you doing? The crossword? Can't you tell? What's a thirteen-letter word for things not turning out the way you had hoped? I'm disappointed. Oh, that's what it is. Disappointment. He wrote the word down in his puzzle, then looked up at her. If you've come to check in on me, I'm fine. No, you're not, Martin. I showed up at the restaurant today. You've been jobless for a week. You're overdue on your bills. You should have called me. I know I showed you how to do that. I wrote the instructions down on a sticky note. Oh, I didn't want to bother you. You're a busy woman. The last thing you need is an old man like me slowing you down or hurting your feelings. Really, you don't have to worry about me. Yes, I do. I always will. I was worried you would start drinking again. Well, don't. I haven't. In fact, yesterday marked one month sober. He reached into the pocket of his shirt and pulled out a coin. Got this at the meeting yesterday. I didn't think you'd go, she said, turning it over in her hand. He smiled. You told me you'd put me in a home if I didn't. Oh, come on. You know I couldn't do something like that to you. I know. Come have a seat. She did as told, watching as he went through his crossword, mindlessly toying with the coin. Martin had always been a humble man, or at least, for as long as Angela had known him. She didn't know him before he lost his family, but she imagined he was probably the same then too. There was a long while where he struggled with finding a purpose in life after their deaths, and she hoped he never had to live through that again. Which was why she had offered him the job at the diner. Initially, he told her he didn't deserve it. He caved under the pressure, eventually, knowing what his alternative was, but he did his best to live his new life as humble as he had always been. How hard was it? she asked him. You don't need to worry about it. I do, Martin. You know I do. She can't behave like this anymore, especially towards you. For all she knows, you're a complete stranger, and she had you fired from my restaurant. Her behavior has to end. It has to be corrected. He looked up from his crossword with raised eyebrows. What are you suggesting? You remember how you taught me back in the day? All too well. I think we need to try the same for her. We can't do that to her. We won't. She'll do it to herself. Maybe then she'll learn. She'll humble herself. Can I at least take my crossword? All right. Make it quick. We're stopping by the apartment office to pay for your rent first. Angela arrived in her living room, carrying a cup of tea, which she set in front of Martin on their coffee table. True to his word, he had taken his crossword, and after spending half an hour trying to convince her she didn't have to pay his rent for him and that he would pay her back, they had come to the shaky agreement that his company for the night was enough. This is a big step up from the street, he said, looking up at her tall ceiling. She had an equally large flat-screen television, which had been switched to a fake fireplace for the moment. You could say that again. So, Martin... Have you had any contact with your kids in a while? I remember that was something you were going to try to do when you had the apartment. Oh, you know how they are. At first I wasn't sure I even had the right phone numbers. I tried calling both of them, but neither responded. Caroline answered my call two days later. She lives in another state now. Is that so? She married the man she was with the last time I saw her two years ago. Sounds like they have a fairly quiet life going on up there. I wish she would come down to visit me at some point soon, but I know that's a privilege I have to earn. 
I'm sure you'll get there, Martin. You stay on the track you're on, and maybe Donovan will call you back too. All I can do is hope, I suppose. I wouldn't blame him if he never answered. Come on, let's work on better self-talk. You're a good man, Martin. The front door opened and Mela stepped in. The living room was out of sight initially, but as she stepped further into the house, removing her shoes and placing them in the hall closet, she called out for her mum. In the living room, she responded. Great, I have to tell you the absolute worst thing that happened today. I was shopping at Burlington and there was this older couple going through the... She stopped dead in her tracks at the sight of Martin in the living room with her mother. He slowly turned and gave her a warm smile as he took a sip of his tea. What is he doing in this house? Mela, this is Martin. He's our guest for the night. Would you be a darling and make us dinner? What sort of sick game did you put my mother up to? She asked, pointing an accusatory finger as she stepped closer to the older man. He did no such thing, Angela said, standing up from her chair. And you would be wise not to insult our guests like this. I'll have you know it was my idea to bring Martin for dinner. He's an old family friend. Well, I'm not hungry. In fact, I was just going to go to my room. Actually, that's perfect then. You're not going to your room. I'm thinking sirloin steaks, Martin. How does that sound to you? Oh, I don't think I'm deserving of something as expensive as sirloins. What other options are there? Nonsense. Two sirloin steaks, please, Mailer. Oh, and make sure you get us some salads as well for the side. Why are you doing this? This is sick and twisted, Mom. You can't bring that man in here after what he did to me at your restaurant. I can and I will. Now go get the steaks from the freezer and get them thawing. Why are you humiliating me? This man is a clumsy, lousy moron. He's too old to hold a job. That's enough, Mela Marie Stone. You do not get to call him that. Do you know what he's done for us, for me, for you? The things he's given up? You know nothing about this man, but chose to have him fired from my restaurant. These are the consequences of your actions. I expect to have those stakes out here in 20 minutes. Why are you defending him? Why does this matter? This is pathetic. I'll tell you why, Mela. We wouldn't be where we are without him. We wouldn't be living in this nice large house with all of this disposable income and a restaurant under my name if he hadn't rescued me years ago. What? When I was your age, I was on the street, begging for money. My mum and dad were long gone, and I was alone in the city. I was starving. I was almost dead. You know who came to help? Martin. He was homeless too, and had been for almost a decade. But he saw me, a teenage girl your age, on the hard cement, crying and starving. And do you know what he did? Did he make fun of me for my position or call me names? No. He gave me all the begging money he'd made over the past month. He gave me money for food, and he took me to the homeless shelter he lived in. He helped get me straightened up and off the street. That is the man you had fired last week. That is the man you've repeatedly insulted to his face. And you've crossed the line. Now go get the steaks from the freezer. I don't care about any of that. I don't care about him. And I especially don't care about your sob story. He made a mistake. And that was the consequences of his actions. I'm not going to stand here and take this from you as if I was in the wrong. I'm going to my room. You do that, and you're in for a world of trouble, young woman. Mela ignored her mother and stomped up the stairs to the second floor, where the slamming of her bedroom door could be heard throughout the house. Angela sighed and put her hands to her temple. It's never easy, Martin said, getting up to put a hand on her shoulder. I know. I hate having to be the bigger person. We all have to grow, even you and I, after all these years.
Long after dinner time passed, and long after Angela had escorted Martin back to his apartment, the mother slowly climbed the carpeted stairs of her house and approached the door to her daughter's room. She stood outside of it for a long time, running through the script in her head. Angela hadn't been much of a life-sharer. When people asked how she'd become so successful, she usually blamed it on her parents and her childhood. But in reality, it was the homelessness that motivated her to climb how she did. It was paying back a debt she owed Martin, whether he wanted the payment or not. She carefully tried the handle to the door, but when it didn't turn, she knocked lightly. Mela, are you still awake in there? Go away, Mom. I think you know I'm not going away. I've calmed down now, and if you have too, I'd like to have a civil discussion. We need to sit down and talk about some things. May I come in? I said go away. I don't want to hear about your struggles, or how Martin was your saviour in a second-hand button-up. Fine, if you're not going to let me in, then I'll tell you from right here. There's more to the story that I didn't tell you. When Mailer didn't respond on the other end, she continued. When he first took me to that homeless shelter and was showing me around, he took me to an area where there were some children. Most of them had a parent or relative that they belonged to, and all of them were over the age of three. All but one. There was a little girl, six months old, who had been abandoned at the homeless shelter. I don't know what about that baby girl had me so heartbroken, but I spent most of my free time alone with her, trying to give her the attention that babies need to survive. Nobody else would. And as I got my first job, Martin promised to help take care of her too. When I was at my minimum wage fast food job, he was watching her at the homeless shelter, and I was working, making enough to feed the three of us. Then, when I was back, he'd go out and beg and give that money to me to build up a fund. Eventually, there came a day where I had enough money. I could afford an apartment and start getting government aid and restart my life. But Martin approached me that day, and he told me... He... The words caught in Angela's throat... She wasn't sure if she could bring herself to talk about it. Part of her hoped Mailer would piece together the thought on her own. Instead, she received the same upset tone she'd gotten earlier. Are you done? Candy tried calling me, and now I need to find out what that was about. So if your little sob story is finished, feel free to walk away. I... Are you serious, Mailer? I cannot believe you. I'm out here pouring my heart and soul out to you and all you can think of is yourself. I don't know where I went wrong with you, but it ends right here. You've brought this upon yourself. Mela paced the floor of her freshman college dorm. Her phone was in her hand, and panic was on her face. She had tried four other times to get in contact with the college bursar's office, and every time had been sent to an automated system. In her struggles to demand to speak to a human, she was running out of time before they would leave for the day, and she'd be in significant trouble. Her little spat with her mother had been three months ago by this point, and though that last remaining week at her house had been tense, she'd survived it. They hadn't hardly talked at all, and her mother hired a small moving truck to help her take her stuff and unload it at the dorm, almost without contact between the two of them. She was still just as upset with her mom as her mom was with her, but depending on how the call with the Burza's office went, she'd have to set aside her pride and call her. At long last, she figured out the combination of buttons to press on her phone before being sent to an actual person on the other end. This is the Burza's office. How can I help you today? Finally, a human. I need to make sure my tuition is paid for next semester. This should have been set up automatically, but seeing as it was my mother that set it up, I doubt if she did it right. Give me just a second. She stopped her pacing to tap her foot on the floor. Okay. It seems the automatic payments were set up at one point, 
but were cancelled about four months ago by Angela Stone. Does that sound right? No, what do you mean? Does that sound right? I just told you I expect the automatic payments to be set up and you ask me if them being cancelled sounds right. Get them turned back on. I'm afraid I can't do that, Mailer. The account holder has to be the one to authorise that action, and that is your mother, I assume. Is she able to restart the payments? Yes, all she'll have to do is call or fill out the information online. Fine, that's all I need to know. She hung up on the worker and immediately switched to her mother's contact before pressing the dial button. It rang four times, but no answer. Now's not the time to be petty, Mom. Pick up. She tried again. Nothing. Again, nothing, again. What time was it back home? Seven. She was still awake. In fact, it was a Thursday, meaning she was at home, likely drinking tea and listening to the evening news. Nothing. So she could answer. Why wasn't she? Again. Nothing. It was starting to set in. Her mum wasn't done being petty about the Martin situation. Two days later, at the end of the semester, she made the flight back to her hometown and had an Uber driver take her back to her mother's house. She tried the door with her key, but it didn't budge. Her mum must have had the locks changed. No matter. She'd slipped out of the house other ways before and knew the secret her mum didn't. If she pressed it against the slidding glass door in the backyard a certain way, she could... The sliding door had been replaced with a new one. In the 40 times she'd tried calling her mum since finding out about the Tweetian payments, she hadn't answered once. Still, as she grew more desperate, she tried more, until her phone was close to death. As the sun went down, she waited on the front porch, expecting her to come home at some point. When that never even happened, and the night grew cold, the severity of the situation had begun to kick in. It's not fair, she whispered to herself, as the snow came down, coating the perfectly parved sidewalk in front of her. Her mum had left her out in the cold, both literally and metaphorically. Why would she do that? Her own daughter. She couldn't do anything. She'd freeze to death before her mum came home at this rate, and she couldn't ask a neighbour or one of her friends if she could stay the night there because she'd appeared desperate and sleeping under a bridge was more appealing than that. Under a bridge, like a homeless person. She laughed out loud. It's not fair. You're sick, Angela Stone. She stood up and wandered towards the nearest place she knew had a bridge and true to her own thoughts, sat down underneath it, barricaded from the worst of the weather. She was still cold, but she managed to fall asleep underneath, exhausted from a long day. When Mela woke up, a person was standing over her. She had thick winter clothes on and looked a little worse for wear, but was about her mother's age. Wake up, kid, she said. I'm awake. Don't touch me. Sorry, are you okay? I don't recognize you. What do you mean? I know all the other homeless around here, so you're either newly homeless or waking up from a bad hangover under a bridge. I'm neither. I have a home, and I certainly do not have a hangover. Then why are you here? Because my mom is petty and has locked me out of my house. Okay, well, why don't we head back to the shelter, and maybe you can try to call your mom to get her to let you back in. I can't imagine someone doing something this cruel. You're telling me, but she won't answer the phone. She's being petty over, well, unimportant. Okay, still, I think you should come with me to the shelter. It beats becoming a human popsicle out here. What do you say? The homeless woman outstretched her hand, waiting for Mela to accept it. Reluctantly, she did and they walked together to the homeless shelter an hour away. There were twenty others inside, all of whom turned to see the unfamiliar face enter the doorway. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the woman said, this is, what did you say your name was? Mela. This is Mela. She needs temporary housing until she's back on talking terms with her mom. Do we have any spare pillows and blankets? A few people moved to give her the supplies, and as she reluctantly accepted their donations, she set up in a corner, far away from the rest of them. Something about all of this told her it wasn't temporary housing, and another part told her this was her mum's plan all along. It wasn't temporary. After a month of trying, Mailer gave up on getting in contact with her mother. Angela Stone seemingly didn't care about her daughter anymore, and so she knew what she had to do next, bite the bullet and get herself on her feet. She spent the next five months hunting for jobs that would accept a homeless person and had to settle for a low-paying fast food restaurant called Burger Delights. On her first day, she walked in and the manager ushered her behind the counter. Glad to have you on the team, Mailer. We have a few training videos to go over and then you'll be primarily working the front counter. We'll also go over how to get your payment and where to go to find out what hours you're working for a week. Any questions? No. Great. Go grab a uniform from the back closet and meet me in the office. She did as told, choosing the best-smelling uniform from the group and sitting in front of an old box television. As the instruction videos played, she reflected on how awful her life had become. Living in a homeless shelter, forced to beg for food and money, hunting for jobs and being turned down because of her economic status. Once the videos were done, she was sent to the front to be trained with one of the older ladies working there. They walked through how to operate the system and the register, and before long, her first customer of the day walked in. Welcome to Burger Delights. How can I help you? I just want a number two. Meal. Uh, no cheese. Great, that'll be twelve dollars. The man held out a twenty. She took the money, which was more than she had held over the entire time she'd been homeless, and put it in the register before returning eight dollars to the man. That'll be right out for you. He nodded and went to his seat. Good job, kid, the trainer said. Now you get to do that two hundred times a night. Exciting stuff. No, not really. As soon as the order was out, a double hamburger with fries, she grabbed the tray in one hand and went to carry it over to the man. At the same time, she approached, a gust of air from the doors opening pushed against her, tipping the tray over and on to the man. He got up, covered in his meal, and an angry expression crawled across his face. Are you serious? Don't you have control over your own hands? All over my good shirt? I'm so sorry, sir. I'll get this taken care of. I'll make sure you get... Mela, is that you? A familiar voice asked. She turned to see Candy, Emma and Tammy standing in the doorway. They were responsible for the gust of air. I, uh, what are you three doing here? Getting lunch, I can't believe you just did that to that man. No, I didn't. I didn't mean to. It was the... I can't believe we ever hung out with you, Emma said. It's always about you, and it's never your fault. What? That's not true. I... Cutting you out of my life was the best thing that ever happened to me, Tammy said. Will you take care of this mess? The man said. I'm going to have a talk with your manager. This is unacceptable. It was all too much. Her old friends, her mistake, the yelling, the accusations, everything. She held back tears as she scrubbed away at the mess she'd made until the manager pulled her back to the office. There wasn't any punishment for her mistake, but she'd learned her lesson. She'd learned too much. For the rest of her shift, all she could think about was how she'd behaved that night with Martin. She'd been so awful to him, and it probably wasn't even his fault. And her friends didn't even want to be friends with her. 
They'd likely only been there for the money, and she let it happen because they made her feel good. They let her be the centre of attention. Other people were always negatively impacted by her actions, all because of her selfishness, and she hadn't cared. When her shift was over, she left the building with a smile, but returned to the homeless shelter with tears in her eyes. Contrary to Mailer's beliefs, Angela Stone did care about her daughter. Rather than let her come back home, Angela's plans were a lot more brutal. She'd spent many nights worrying over it, but as soon as she saw the job application come in from a Mailer Stone at one of her newly owned fast food restaurants, her shoulders relaxed. It took her daughter six months to land a job, and, as she found out via a phone call with the manager of that location, it took her less than a day to absolutely biff the job, and that was the most that Angela needed to know about the situation. She'd asked to stay hands-off of the situation, opting for Mailer to naturally figure it out as she went, and for almost two years after that, it seemed to be going well, until she quit working at Burger Delights. Angela got the call from the manager halfway through her day. She was getting ready to go on her lunch break when she'd been told that Mailer put in her two weeks and had left to go somewhere else. It didn't make sense. She'd risen to the rank of breakfast manager and doubled her pay with steady hours, unless she found a better opportunity, which she doubted. As soon as the phone call was over, she hovered her fingers over the buttons. It had been two years with no contact. She had no way of knowing how Mailer would respond, but she had to try. Angela dialed her daughter's number and the phone rang. Hello, a voice said on the other end. Hey, is this Mailer Stone? Mom? Oh, Mailer, I... It's been too long. Why are you calling? I heard you quit your job at Burger Delights. What? How did you know that? I own the entire chain, dear. Of course you do. Yeah, I quit. I have a new opportunity. I'm... I'm glad to hear. I'm sorry I never answered your calls. I... I know, Mom. I know why you did it. And I forgive you. Okay. Hey, maybe we can get dinner sometime soon and catch up. Yeah, I'd like that. How's Friday? There's this new place called Dinner by Design, not far from home. Heard about them. A new competitor. May as well see what all the fuss is about. Great. And could you bring Martin? Is he still around? I'll make sure he makes it. I'll see you Friday. Okay. I love you, Mom. I love you too, Mela. Angela and Martin arrived together at dinner by design at around five o'clock. He wore his newest button-up T-shirt, which he had bought on sale at a retail clothing store, a big step Angela had urged him to take. The shirt pocket was weighed down by a two-year coin, which moved slightly with each limped step. It's small, Angela said, giving the outside a good look. Looks nice, though, Martin said. I hope I brought enough to pay for myself. Angela held the first set of doors open for him, and Martin did the same for the inner doors. There was a woman at the front counter who looked at the two of them with a smile. Welcome. Do you two have reservations? I think they're under the name Mailer Stone, Angela said. Um, let me confirm that real quick. The woman picked up a corded phone and dialed a number. Hey, there's a man and woman up here saying they have a reservation under Mailer's name. Is that right? Yes, it is, Mailer said, rounding the corner, wearing a fancy suit to rival her mother's. Thank you, Gemma. If you'll follow me, we'll go to our booth. Mailer led the two of them all the way to the back where there were private rooms. She opened one, which already had non-alcoholic drinks set up, and motioned for them to come in. What's going on? Angela asked, picking one of the booth seats. Surprise! This is my new opportunity! 
Working for my rivals? Not quite. I own this place. What? Mela sat down next to her mother. Yeah, I've been saving up for a while now, living in a really cheap apartment with roommates, hoarding every penny until I could get the down payment on a new restaurant. Plus a loan from the bank, who was happy to give it to a young stone entrepreneur following in her mother's footsteps. This is my place. I did it. You. You did it. A group of servers brought in three plates, each with a sirloin, salad, and fries. She thanked them as they left, then gestured to the plates. Dig in, folks, and wear as much of it as you want. Martin smiled at her. It's good to see you, Mela. You too. I, uh, I'm sorry for how I was before. What I did was wrong, and I know that now. I'm sorry for yelling at you and getting you fired and then losing my temper when you were at Mum's house. You don't deserve it. You've done so much for me and I've done nothing for you. And I've learned my lesson. All it took was being homeless and some karma for me to figure it all out. At least it only took you two years, her mom said, already eating. Great, sirloin. Think I recognize the recipe? Nope, I've made some changes. No worries of stealing recipes here. I can show you if you want. Never show a competitor your recipes. Well, we can talk about that later. How are things? It's been a long two years. It's been lonely. I've missed you. I wish I would have called you just to hear your voice. I've closed some business deals and expanded the company. Sure, but that means nothing without you. You were the reason I was doing all of this in the first place. I appreciate it. I think we can all guess what my time was like. Lots of working, no time for fun. I remember those days, Martin said. I've been back at the diner ever since. I've gone up in importance there, and your mum insists it was natural progression, not favouritism. You went to see your children recently too, Angela said. That's true. They live in another state. My daughter and my son. Seeing how much they've grown over the years, there's a certain pride. They've done better than I ever did, and I've been given permission to come and visit whenever I want, as long as I give some warning. Good to hear, Mela said. So what are your plans? Her mom asked. With this place? I don't know yet. I never thought I'd make it this far. I guess I'll see where this takes me. And if I have the time between this and Katie, maybe I'll think about finishing my business degree online. Katie? Who's Katie? On cue, the door to the room opened and a toddler walked in. Mama! She yelled, embracing Mela. Hey, sweet pea, are you hungry? No, not right now. Are you sure? We have fries. I want fries. Here, have some of mine. The toddler climbed into the booth next to Martin and grabbed a few from her plate. This is Katie. I... I took a page out of your book and realized I needed a reason. She was a year old when she was sent to the homeless shelter, and nobody else really had the motivation to take care of her. So... Tada, I adopted her. I didn't really plan for that to happen, but it was the next logical step. Angela's bottom lip quivered. Oh, Mela, I... Martin nodded at her, as if letting her know it was okay. I've been struggling to find a good time to tell you this. A good way. But there isn't one. Do you remember when you locked yourself in your room and I was telling you my story? Yeah? Well, that wasn't all of it. I was about to get my first apartment, and Martin told me I had to take that little girl with me to give her another chance at life. So, as soon as I could afford it, I had to adopt her. Mela leaned forward a little more. Are you saying... She wasn't my little girl. I cared for her, but she wasn't my own. But he was right. He couldn't care for her forever and I couldn't leave her to the life she'd had before me. So I waited longer, 
And on the same day I signed for my apartment, I signed the adoption papers. I told him I'd come back for him, but he said not to worry. To get us to a point where we were comfortable, before worrying about an old man like him. And so, I took my newly adopted daughter to my new apartment, and eight months later, I was manager at the fast food restaurant. And I was that little girl? I still have the adoption papers at the top of my dresser. Mela Marie Stone. That was the single greatest day of my life. Not because of the apartment, but because I had you. I had saved you from the life that I had lived, and I promised myself that your life would be better. And I'm sorry because this is maybe the worst way to find out you were adopted, but you had to know. You had to know why Martin is so important, and that's why it was important that Martin worked at the restaurant, and that you treated him with respect, but I see you've taken my advice. Mela stared at her mother with incredulous eyes. I... I don't know what to say. I understand. That's a lot to take in. No, I mean, it makes sense. But what a coincidence. She rubbed Katie's back and could feel a tear threatening to break out from her eye. Angela leaned over and they embraced, finally letting their emotions free. The night ended when Katie got too tired and started to fall asleep in the booth. But the three of them were laughing and mending their broken relationships. As Mela stepped into her apartment, struggling with the keys while carrying her adopted daughter in, she sighed with content. Once Katie was in her toddler bed and asleep again, she took her suit off, switched into pyjamas, and crawled into bed with a smile. Life was no longer all about herself, it was about Katie and giving the world to that little girl with a big heart. Well, and maybe a little about herself too.